Good morning. I'm so glad you could be with me today as we unfold God's Word together. We're in the midst of in a study of the book of Romans. We're in the first chapter. Uh, today I want to pick up our reading in verse 24 of Romans chapter 1. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they had exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, then men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. I think I'll stop the reading right there. We've been learning about the problem of sin. We've talked about the power of the gospel, that it provides a means of forgiveness for sin. And that power is necessary because all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And sin matters because sin separates us from the holy God who is there. In other words, as we've been learning earlier in the first chapter, the God who loved us enough to send his son into this world to die for us, to create the gospel, the good news, is also a God who holds us accountable for our sin and rebellion against him. While he is loving as part of his very nature, he is also righteous, holy, and just. And he can't stop being any of those things because that's who he is, the God of the universe. And therefore, there is a consequence from sin. And all are sinners and separated because of that sin from God facing accountability. We talked about the essence of that sin, that rebellion against God involved, number one, ungodliness, your reverence for God, rejecting the greatest of the commandments. It involved unrighteousness, the active breaking of God's moral standards. It involved actions to very suppress the truth that could be known about God, suppressing it even in our own hearts. It involved refusing to honor God and bow the knee before him and refusing to thank him for his role in our lives. It involved our determination to turn from his revelation in the scriptures, to trust our own thinking and the thinking of other men to find truth. And we ended up, all of us, worshiping something else other than the God for whom we were created to worship. Now today, building on all of that that we've been looking at, starting in verses 24 and on through the remainder of chapter 1, we begin to encounter some of the co tragic consequences of our sin and suppression of the truth about God. And these consequences, these outcomes that God is identifying for us in these verses, does a lot to explain to us the nature of the human condition, both the personal condition talks about us and people that we know, and also the societal conditions. Let's begin to look at this together. The characteristic phrase, the core phrase that provides the thread throughout the passage is found in verse 24, verse 26, and in verse 28. And the phrase is, therefore God gave them up. God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, and God gave them up to debased minds to do what ought not to be done. Verse 24, 26, and 28. God gave them up. Now, what does that mean exactly, that God gave them up? Well, this phrase, give up, or gave up, literally means to give into the hands of another power. This does not mean that God makes us sin. We don't need God's help to do that. <laughs> we all sin anyway. In fact, God would never help one to sin. Now, it doesn't mean that, but what it does mean is that God gives us over to the power of sin operating in this world. 
when you and I and all of us have decided to turn away from God. Remember, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And when we continue to decide not to honor him or turn back to him or repent, God says, I gave you over. I gave you over to the control of sin in your life. The truth of the matter, as you work through the scriptures, beginning in the book of Genesis, right on through the end in the book of Revelation, we discover that you and I as human beings don't do a good job resisting the temptation to sin. We don't handle it very well. It's proven everywhere, from Genesis 3 and the perfect conditions of the garden on up to the current day, and will be demonstrated right on through the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, that's why in the Lord's Prayer, the Lord encouraged Jesus, encouraged us to say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why? We don't want God to lead us into temptation because we do a miserable job handling it. All right? That's true for the believer. Think of what's true for the unbeliever. They don't handle it well. And you say, well, how do we know that's the case? Well, life itself ought to demonstrate the truth of that, but let's build on it for a moment and say, well, how does the word of God describe it? Back in Genesis chapter 4, as Cain is grappling with the fact that he couldn't come to God on his own terms, he had to come to God God's way, he got angry. And in Genesis 4, 6, Jesus, or God responds to him, he says, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you or to control you, but you must rule over it. But Cain didn't, and no one since has. Sin is always crouching at the door. This dynamic later on in the book of Romans will be built a bit bigger. In, in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 14, it says, Do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. God is saying sin is a powerful, powerful problem. It is a powerful temptation. It captivates us, seeks to reign in us, make us obey its passions. Well, what's the point? Well, the point is this. Far from being free when we don't surrender before the Lord, admitting our sin and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, when we try to maintain our own freedom and autonomy, far from being free, the Bible says we become slaves. We become enslaved. We are people under the power of sin, not the power of our own control. We're under the power of sin that's been crouching at the door. Remember the words to Cain? It's crouching at the door. It desires to control us. We all have that problem. We differ from one another in the degree of slavery, perhaps, but not in the reality of it. Jesus underscored this in John chapter 8. Listen to these verses, beginning in verse 34 of John chapter 8. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Notice, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Everyone practices sin. That's the point thus far in the book of Romans. Everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The result is that everyone is a slave. The only pathway out of that slavery is the freedom found in the gospel. And Jesus meant it when he said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. There is a freedom from the enslaving effects of sin. The gospel summarizes that freedom for us. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the uh, apologist, English apologist, uh, who died in 1963, said this, 
the lost enjoy forever the horrible freedom they've demanded and therefore are self-enslaved. They demanded freedom from being honoring God and submitting before the Lord and being in right relationship with God. But the freedom they gained is self-enslavement. They are under the power of sin. Well, join me tomorrow as we talk more about God giving them up because it tells us much about our personal condition and the condition of our society. God bless.